Hey, veggie lover. We have four weeks left of 2022. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. You are listening today to a replay of the number four most downloaded episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. So for the last five weeks of the year, we are doing a countdown of the top five downloaded episodes to celebrate five years of Veggie Doctor Radio, the last five weeks of the year, the new coming year, and to thank you very much. So this is episode number 194 entitled How to Make Plant-Based Eating Ridiculously Easy with Carly Bodrug from Plant You. And it originally aired February 13th of this year. So just the beginning of this year, things were different at the beginning of the year, right? So now we're at the end of the year and we get to hear this conversation again. Carly is just the most cutest, adorable person. She has such wonderful content and her book is amazing. So if you haven't already listened to this episode, definitely listen to it. She's got some great tips that are very applicable. But if you have listened to it and you haven't bought her book, what are you waiting for? This is a great Christmas gift as well. So get lots of copies and give it to all your friends and family, especially people that are new to plant-based eating because she makes it so easy, so beautiful, so simple to make these recipes. Okay, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a listener. Thank you for making Veggie Doctor Radio successful. I appreciate you so much. And now let's re-listen to episode number 194, How to Make Plant-Based Eating Ridiculously Easy with Carly Bodrug from Plant You, the number four most downloaded episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Welcome back, veggie lovers, to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio. Today, I have the founder of Plant You, Carly Bodrug. She is the cutest and the sweetest and super amazing. She has a new book coming out very soon. Talk all about it in the episode. But Carly Bodrug is the founder of Plant You, a social community of over a million followers whose mission is to help people eat more plants through simple and approachable vegan recipes, a digital meal planner, podcast, and everyday lifestyle tips. She lives in Ontario, Canada with her fiance, Jesse, and Persian cat, King Tut. King Tut is the most adorable cat ever, so definitely get on her Instagram, follow her, so you can see pictures not only of the amazing food she creates, but of her adorable cat. In this episode, we're going to talk about her plant-based journey, how growing up on a hobby farm may have caused some cognitive dissonance as she transitioned, how the rest of her family eats, if she cooked before she went plant-based, what her biggest fail has been in her plant-based cooking journey, why she wrote this book, how it came to life. The story is amazing. You're going to love it. And she has so many practical tips for everybody, but especially for you moms out there that I know you're balancing and juggling so much. But let's just head into this episode because I know you're going to love it. So here she is, Carly Bodrug. Carly Bodrug, founder of Plant You. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am so, so grateful to be here with you today and to talk about plants with your incredible audience. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm super, super excited. I feel like I am in the presence of a celebrity, like a shooting star right now. You are about to 
publish this amazing cookbook. But before we talk about your cookbook and where it's going, let's start at the beginning. Like so many years back before this was even a figment of your imagination, how did you become plant-based? Tell me about your plant-based journey and what triggered the change? So when I was 11 years old, my father was diagnosed with stage two colon cancer. And uh, like many kids, my dad definitely like my hero. And it was very traumatic. Uh, He had the colon cancer surgery and then chemotherapy for several months after. And the interesting part about it is back then on the Canada Food Guide specifically, We thought that eating meat and dairy was the healthiest thing you could do. So I lived on a hobby farm all growing up and for breakfast, lunch and dinner, a meal really wasn't complete without either meat or dairy, if not both. So my dad went from having this really life-changing diagnosis and we just continued eating the meat and dairy and thank goodness he is a survivor. But fast forward to 2015 and the World Health Organization announced that red and processed meat were now classed as group two and group one carcinogens. And really what I remember from that day is that my dad was angry because Mm -hmm. we had just been like, feasting on the very thing that could have contributed to the cancer, if not very much did not help matters. And from that point on, as my immediate family, we started transitioning to a plant-based lifestyle. And what I always say to people is that like, when you kind of open the lid to that plant-based lifestyle, it's like opening Pandora's box. So very quickly, I learned about the environmental impact of animal agriculture, the factory farming and the devastation to our animals, as well as the incredible health benefits, all pointing to a plant predominant diet being just this incredible thing for your health on every level. So I did not know how to cook, number one. Number two, literally the biggest meat eater, uh, cheese eater you know. So I was truly, truly starting from square one and I decided to start kind of documenting my own personal journey to adopting a plant-based lifestyle on Instagram under the name Plant You. Set up a website, started blogging and sharing like my really, really simple recipe creations, which at the time I remember like one of the first things I did when I decided I really wanted to start eating plant based was go on Pinterest and search the word vegan. And it was like this endless stream of these absolutely gorgeous nourish bowls with like carved avocados and spiralized zucchini. (laughs) And I was like, I can't do this. Like I don't this 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 is too much. So I took the approach of really just swapping regular things in the food that I already enjoyed eating. So like my mom's uh, bolognese pasta and swapping in lentils for the ground beef instead. And that's the approach I took and kind of built up on it. And I think that really is why my Instagram channel was probably successful from the get-go was because it seemed accessible to regular people like me who had no idea what they were doing. I love that. I love how you took this minimalist and essentialist approach and that whenever you saw these pictures of this gourmet food that took a lot of time to prepare, that it didn't discourage you. Instead, it inspired you to find a different way. So inherently, you are a problem solver at heart. I love that. What was your motivation to start your documenting your journey? Like you said, to start the Instagram and start the website. Was it because you were feeling passionate that you wanted other people to learn about this? Or did you feel like that was going to keep you accountable, a combination of those things? It was a combination. So uh, I come from a journalism background. My education, I have a degree in broadcast journalism. I was actually working as a radio host when all of this happened. So my natural inclination was to share things, right? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I cannot tell you, and I don't want to get like too (laughs) woo-woo about this, but I felt so called from a soul's purpose to share about a plant-based lifestyle. And it's like this thing, it's typical, right? You hear about vegans, like they they want to shake people. And I get that because like, I just felt like, oh my goodness, 
this plant-based lifestyle is amazing for our health, amazing for our planet, amazing for the animals. Why is nobody talking about this? Above and beyond that, of course, my dad's cancer was a driving factor, but I also, as a child, uh, had been prescribed laxatives as a kid because I was so constipated. So <laughs> this constipation issue lasted up until my early 20s. And what do you know, as soon as I go plant-based, that was that was the solve. And I realize now it was com a complete lack of fiber in the diet. But that was another driving force for me to be like, people need to know about this. Like it's, it's very simple changes in your lifestyle and it can have such a dramatic impact in every level of your life. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I can empathize and relate. I was also a constipated kid, a constipated adult, took the vitamin M or the Marilax for so many years. And yeah, that's not a problem anymore. I am now a super pooper, the super <laughs> pooper category, and I am proud. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a nice place to be. It's crazy to think about because I, I know you probably get this every day as well, but everybody's always like, where do you get your protein? And I'm like, oh my goodness, we're focusing on the wrong thing here. Like, oh, something like over 90% of North Americans are not hitting their fiber amounts for the day. And like, we're all walking around constipated, which is not a good feeling. <laughs> and fiber wow. is in plants, right? Like meat and cheese are devoid of fiber. So if that's what you're primarily eating, you've got to think your digestive system is just naturally sluggish which mine certainly was and it's scary to think that a doctor I was like 12 was like oh just here's some laxatives <laughs> yeah it's just so common it's one of the most common reasons that children go to the pediatrician is chronic abdominal pain and constipation so yeah we've got our protocol down pat <laughs> you know um, but speaking of meat and dairy Let's go back to you growing up on a hobby farm and you were surrounded by animals. You grew up with the notion that this is natural. This is normal. This is what we have to do as humans, but we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to do it more natural. You know, the things that go along with that. So when you and your family learned more about plant-based nutrition, its association with health, but also of course, like you said, the Pandora's box, it all comes flooding in and you're just like, what? Did you struggle with cognitive dissonance as you were learning about that and trying to reconcile that with your childhood experiences? It was really odd. So when I say a hobby farm, like my parents live on a hobby farm, but we had chickens that we ate the eggs of and horses, but we weren't actually farming meat per se. With that mm -hmm. said, we ate meat for every meal. We used the eggs and whichever else. But it's so interesting because my parents and even my sister, who's a vet tech now, biggest animal lovers you can find. Like my whole life, my dad and sister were constantly rescuing birds that were like injured on the property and like mm -hmm. taking in cats and dogs and whichever else. So that cognitive dissonance, huge like it it still to this day rocks me that we would be like taking in whatever animal that <laughs> is hurt or injured on on the property and then sitting down and having like a steak for dinner it's it's the weirdest yeah. thing and you you have to wonder right like where does that where does that come from why are we so conditioned to think that this is just a normal thing to do? Because when you, when you open that Pandora's box, you quickly realize that this is very odd, actually. Like, especially the dairy milk thing. Like, drinking uh, milk from another animal, when you really start to think about that, it's like, this is weird. Why, why, why were we doing that? So 100%. And I think it takes a while to come to terms with that you've been conditioned your entire life to believe this thing, but how did it happen? It's weird. Exactly. And the conditioning goes deep. In fact, the other day I was having a conversation with my kids. I like to just philosophize with them and throw hypothetical questions out at them. But a few years back, they actually had very short time, very temporarily, an ice cream store in Washington, D.C., that was made from human breast milk. I don't know if you heard about this. It didn't last too long. But I asked my kids, I was like, would y'all you, would you drink or would y'all eat ice cream made from 
human breast milk and they're like, Ugh, no, <laughs> you know, but, and I think the same thing, like, I'm just like, oh, that just sounds disgusting to me. Like I wouldn't do that, but of course it's okay for our human babies. And then it's okay for us to drink cow's milk, which like I, my, my family are dairy farmers. And so I grew up seeing milked cows. And at the beginning, when I was a little, they were still milking by hand. Now they use, you know, the equipment and the machines to do it, but they poop at the same time. They poop and they pee often while they're being milked. And that poop like literally splatters on the ground and gets into the buckets. Like it's getting everywhere. And I remember seeing that and I was like, that's kind of gross, but I'm just, it was, it was like putting your fingers in your ears and like, la, 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 la. Okay. I'm just going to pretend I didn't see that. And I'm going to go drink my milk, <laughs> you know? So, but it's funny because the conditioning is so deep that even now as vegans, my kids are like, yeah, no, I wouldn't be able to drink that. But at the same time, they'd probably be fine flexing here and there for dairy, you know, as they do at sometimes at birthday parties and stuff. It doesn't cause that same disgust or reaction in the pit of their stomach that another thing would so it's yeah it's super interesting to me it's weird well, it's just weird <laughs> yeah it is it's human brain is just fascinating really um tell me about the transition for the rest of your family so it sounds to me like y'all all learn this at the same time you're father had this reaction, you know, like, why didn't anybody tell me? Why didn't my doctor tell me this? It seems like they should tell me this. Then did everybody transition at the same time or did it go in phases? How did it happen? It's interesting. So I was like, I was motivated. So I'm like, I'm going vegan. And it took me a year actually to go completely vegan, but I was motivated. That was the direction I was heading. My parents my mom right away was like, I'm giving up the meat and the seafood, but now I still eat cheese. And my dad was like, I'm going plant-based, but if I'm out for dinner, I might have like a burger or something. And still to this day, my parents are like that. But I think it's a testament to my dad is now 71, my mom 65. And this was seven years ago. So like... I think at any age, it's amazing that they were so adaptable and open to that. My fiance as well, I've been with him for um, 10 years. He probably had the most visceral reaction when I was like, yeah, I'm going vegan. And he was like, what do you mean? <laughs> because <laughs> up until that point, our favorite food was like steak. So he's like, how is this going to impact our relationship, right? Which is a real concern. But um, yes. over the years, I've won him over and he's now like 95% plant-based. I'm, I'm working on that 5%, but that's hard. Like, I feel like yeah. that last bit is a, is a hard needle to move. And 95% is amazing. And we all have such different personalities. I think me and you are more similar in that, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get there. We're there. We're committed. And this is really important to us. It aligns with our values. It's just like a values thing. But some people, you know, it's, they go most of the way and they're cool with it. But really, most of the way, 90, 95% is amazing. It's amazing for health. It's amazing for the environment. It's amazing for the animals. So I don't know, sometimes for some personality types, getting that last juice out of the squeeze may be a little, ugh, might not be worth it, but we'll see over time what happens. I think you each know? person has to have their own experiences too. Like my husband, he is an avid mountain biker and skier, and he loves being outdoors and pushing himself physically. And what finally got him to stop eating meat was more tuning into his body and realizing that when he ate meat, he felt heavy and sluggish and he didn't want to feel like that when he was trekking up that mountain on a bike. He wanted to feel light and adaptable and nimble. And that was, that's his motivation is tuning into his body and be like, I don't want to feel like that. You know, I have such like a similar story. My fiance just competed in his first Ironman this summer. And I can't wow. tell you, like he just said that when he is eating 100% plant-based. He just feels so much better from an inflammation perspective and a performance perspective. So that really wins some people over. And what I always tell people on my channel, I think the social aspect is very stressful for people. And it was for me yes. at first as well. It was like, what am I going to tell people? How am I going to go to my Thanksgiving dinner and not participate in the turkey? And like what I tell people 
and this sometimes gets a bad reaction from the vegan community, but I feel like if people are 99% there and they're eating plant-based in their home, if the sushi dinner is the one thing stopping you, just have the sushi and move on. Like it's not about being perfect. This is a lifelong commitment to live in alignment with your morals or a better health. And um, at the end of the day, it's the 99% that matters, not that 1% meal that's stressing you out and then derailing you because you feel like you screwed up. So beautifully said. Thank you so much. You mentioned that you really didn't start cooking until six years ago. So what was life for you before that? Was it a bunch of takeout or how did you prepare food before you went plant-based? So it's funny, my university roommates must think what has happened to her because I showed up <laughs> to college with like a freezer full of Eggo waffles, t- tater tots, frozen pizzas. Like I was the worst eater I, I know. And I got by like that through college and then I graduated and got a job and it was like, uh-oh, this is like, probably should start eating healthier. So then I swayed to like chicken breasts, rice, green beans, just really bland, kind of awful food. And that's what I thought I needed to be eating in order to achieve kind of peak health in my dream body. And then finally, I made the switch to plant-based, best choice ever, obviously. But that really started my culinary journey. I mean, before that, I had never delved into cooking. And what I always tell people as well is they're like, oh, isn't a plant-based lifestyle restrictive? And I'm like, actually, before I went plant-based, like the plant-based world just opened me up to all of these different types of food and cuisines and recipes that I would have never tried otherwise. I was just going through this constant rotation of like three cuts of meat on my plate every day. And it forces you to get creative in the kitchen. And I fell in love with it. Like I fell in love with cooking so quickly because the other aspect of it is like cooking chicken and whichever else used to kind of give me anxiety because it's like, is it cooked right or whichever else? You don't have those same risks when you're cooking with plants. They're kind of sometimes hard to screw up. Like you can overcook some broccoli, but to me it's still edible. So it allowed me kind of like this playing field to really experiment and fall in love with cooking and food in a way I had never experienced before. 100% agree. I I feel like we could be twins in this area because I was the same. I've since I left college, I loved experimenting with food and I started to learn how to experiment with food. But the same thing, I felt anxious around meat, like E. coli, infection, and is this rotten yet? Like, how can you tell? And you know, like these kinds of things. So once I ditched the animal products, it felt like this open space, open playing field. And I felt like you can almost, you can't go wrong. You know, that's how I felt. And I think that really opened up the world and definitely, absolutely no shadow of a doubt that my diet became more abundant after I went plant-based than before. I was definitely more on that chicken and broccoli and yogurt diet. You know, that's supposed to be the healthy version of the standard American diet is your unsweetened yogurt chicken breast and broccoli. Those were the three food groups, you know? So, and even more dairy than that, you know, dairy, dairy, dairy was a lot that I ate. But even though we do have this perception that you can't go wrong, do you have any stories about any fails you had at the beginning of the journey? Is there anything that you can tell us that you tried that just did not work out? There's still recipes that don't work out. First of all, baking is a whole other game. Like I agree that like cooking a stir fry, I feel like I can't go wrong. Whatever happens, I can fix it. Soup, we're good. Baking, things things can go awry. So I remember testing a oil-free brand muffin recipe with my dad actually for the cookbook impossible like we (laughs) they were they were coming out of the oven like literal rocks like you could have throw (laughs) in throw in one and it would have hurt so that's one and then the other one is that I was laughing about earlier today is I had there's a recipe in my cookbook for a beautiful lentil chickpea loaf that's like a vegan meatloaf that is probably the most tested recipe in the book. No matter what I was doing, for some reason, it was coming out mushy. And my fiance to this day will not eat 
vegan meatloaf because I made him eat like so much. Everything. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't wasting food. So it's like these mushy loaves were coming out day in, day out. I'm like, what's for dinner? Mushy meatloaf. And oh, still to this day, there's recipe screw ups. It's part of the process, but that plant based element does add a factor of like, most things are worth saving and can be edible if you if you want to eat that. it. I love that. He's like, I've had a lifetime of vegan meatloaf, honey. That's I'm good. No more for me, thanks. <laughs> All right. What are the things that you feel made your transition easier? I always tell people the easiest way to transition, in my opinion, rather than overwhelming yourself and trying a bunch of really random new recipes, is to take an audit of what you typically eat in a week. So perhaps you start your day with cereal, um, you have a beautiful wrap, chicken wrap for lunch, and dinners like a uh, curry with beef or chicken or something like that. Look at that, you love that food already, How can you make really simple plant-based swaps to make those meals vegan? So using plant-based milk in your cereal in the morning, swapping out the chicken in your wrap for lunch for maybe a tofu, and then having like a curry with chickpeas instead of the meat. There's uh, meals that you already know you love, that you already know the foundational elements of how to cook them, and you've now just had an entirely plant-based day just like that. So though that's my number one tip is to kind of like look at what you're already eating and what you already love. Above and beyond that, I say start slow for the most part. It depends, of course, if somebody needs like a health it, they, or they're having a health crisis and they really need to change their diet. But if you're in the position where you feel that you can transition slowly from a health perspective, I feel like that can lead to oftentimes a more success in the long term of a plant-based lifestyle because you're not overwhelming yourself trying to learn how to cook all of these different cuisines. For example, like I was one of those people who said that they could never give up cheese. And then slowly, like maybe a couple months into my plant-based journey, I learned that you could make like a tofu ricotta and you can blend cashews into a beautiful cashew cream or make like a vegan cream cheese out of it. And these are things that come with time, but once you have them in your cooking arsenal, it's incredible food that you can lean on that really replaces any of those animal products that you feel like you need in your lifestyle. So slow changing out a few meals per week at first and building up week over week is a a strategy that I always suggest to people and not being too hard on yourself. Again, it's a journey, not a race. Like it's not a wagon that if you fall off of, you need to like just quit. It's, it's a overall lifestyle change. Beautiful. Yeah, it's a journey. It's a process. And over time, you can tweak, you can edit it, you can try different things. Some things may not work for you. You can take that out if it doesn't work for you. But I love that tip. And I tell that to patients and my people that follow me too, is that you can start where you are. You don't have to change what you like to eat. It's so easy nowadays to just veganize it, you know, like it's just like you were saying, it's just so simple and an easy place for people to start is with plant milk because there's over 20 different types of plant milk commercially available now. And it just like blows your mind. Like every day they come up with a new one. So it's got to be 25 by now, you know, so that's a great place to start, you know, because people usually use milk throughout the day and different things, either in their coffee and their cereal and their smoothies. So that's an easy place to start. I want to hear more about your journey into sustainability and low waste cooking. So I definitely am interested in this as well. My family and I, we practice minimalism and it's a practice, (laughs) but we do our best and try to make our home as sustainable as possible. How did you get into this? So definitely one of the core motivations for leading a plant-based lifestyle is the environmental impact that animal agriculture has. And as you start to kind of dig into that, you realize that food waste is a real issue. I think something around 40 to 50% of edible food actually is wasted in North America, which contributes to methane and in turn global warming. So... Mm -hmm. I've just been doing these things in my home, these little hacks to kind of reduce my our own personal household food waste. 
and one day I threw one up on Instagram I think it was like orange peel candy and people just went nuts over it so I'm like oh like people are interested in this so I just started sharing the hacks that we already do in, uh, in my home but then it's kind of propelled me to learn a lot more about low waste living and this desire to really kind of look at the things I use in my everyday life and like you I like to align myself with minimalism I don't know that I'm doing a perfect job but again it's a, it, that's a journey within itself and I think if you're kind of going down the plant-based path it's kind of a natural step to start looking at other factors of your life and the impact that they have on our planet because she needs help. It's, it's, it's a, it can be scary when you look at the data for sure. And every little bit helps. There's no perfection. I mean, there's different levels. I, I would be embarrassed to show you my lipstick collection and now how many frames I have for these glasses. They're magnetic frames. And I have like 18 now because I cannot stop buying them because I just love the color. So yeah, I'm not perfect, but you, you make choices in your life. Where are there areas where I feel like I can reduce my use of something or reuse it or not buy another one? So my car got totaled in November, my little baby that I'd had for 12 years. I loved her, little Subaru Impreza Outback Sport. She was so cute, two-toned. My husband looked after it got totaled and there were no other ones used available in the whole country. That is how rare and unique she was, okay? So we opted instead to see if we could go without my car because my son drives he has to drive to school and then we have so we only have two cars for three drivers and that's been since November and my husband and I both are able to walk to work so we take turns walking to work while the other one has the car to pick up my younger son who still doesn't drive so we're gonna see how long we can make it before it becomes utterly frustrating <laughs> but you know little things like that like how, what little tweaks can you make in your lifestyle so that you contribute less to this climate change and the use and the waste and all of the things that we're creating as being humans on this planet. But I love that you address that because there's some people that just aren't aware. And then once they become aware, they can start making changes that fit within their lifestyle. Little by little, each, each year you add something different that you're willing to do. And as your situation changes, changes in your life, there's some things that you're willing to do now that maybe you weren't before. So I'm glad that you do it. Thank you. And one thing I do want to mention is that I feel like oftentimes the onus is put on individuals as well to like make these changes, which it, there should be. But also remembering that the top like 100 companies contribute to something like 80% of greenhouse gases. So what this movement is really doing, choices that you're making, choices that I'm making, and this message that we're spreading is I think it, what we're going to see is an industry shift, which is what we need to see, right? Less, less demand for uh, single use plastics means that industry and these plastic companies are going to have to start paying attention and coming up with an eco-friendly alternative. So it's really about kind of like shifting the industry in numbers and doing the best we can. And that's, that's all we can do as individuals, right? Such a great point. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And it reminds me of just the plant-based movement. We're definitely making a wave. The consumer is talking. I said on one of my previous podcasts, a few podcasts ago about how they do the little year wrap on the meal delivery service, which I forget which one it is now, that the Beyond Burger, the Impossible Burger, it was a, some kind of plant-based burger, was number one of the orders in the country and it had gone up 444% from the previous year. So more people are ordering alternatives for whatever reason, whether it's for the environmental reasons or whether they think it's better for the health or whether it's a you know animal reason, then for whatever reason, there's a shift. There's a shift in more products that are plant-based, more plant milks like we were talking about before. And it is because we as consumers are making those choices. And so we drive the market the same way that we can with these products, less plastic, less packaging in general, <laughs> you know? So yeah, that's a great, great point. All right, let's transition to this beautiful book that you've written. Thank you so much for writing this book. So tell me the story about this. Where did the idea come from to write a cookbook? And what do you hope people will get from this book? 
So in 2019, after several years of kind of going on the Instagram, building a Facebook page, getting kind of a readership on my blog, I was able to take the jump and leave my full-time job at the time to pursue Plant You full-time. And it was really interesting. I've never actually told this story, but I started following Dr. Will Bolsowitz, who is this incredible gut health doctor who I'm sure you know about. He's just like the best. And um, I was like, everybody needs to follow this guy because the information he's putting out here is so groundbreaking. It's um, in basically he talks about how the gut health microbiome impacts every aspect of our health in a plant predominant diet feeds uh, positive gut bacteria without getting too into the weeds. You should have him on here because he's, he's fantastic. So anyways, he, we started talking back and forth and he's like, oh, like when, is your, when are you gonna publish a cookbook? And I had never really thought about it up until this point because I didn't see myself as someone who could publish a cookbook. I was like, I'm not like Martha Stewart or Rachel Ray. Like I barely <laughs> consider myself a good cook. And um, he was generous enough to give me a call and talk to me about the book publishing process. And it kind of lit a fire under me. And it was the weirdest thing. Three days after that phone call, I had a literary agent message me on Instagram. And the most wonderful woman. Synchronicity. <laughs> yeah, it was the craziest thing. It was just the weirdest thing. She has been like such a light in my life. And so then the book process began because she's like, you need to do a plant-based cookbook. And at the time, my account had really grown. I wasn't doing any videos. And my account had grown foundationally from sharing these infographic recipes, which include like the ingredients on the top and the finished dish below. Really simple plant-based recipes that I was cooking so people knew if I was cooking it, they could cook it. And I was like, this needs to be in a cookbook because visually I feel like people can look at the the ingredients in the final dish below and it seems doable which is the whole point mm -hmm. so I'm like this needs to be in a cookbook that was a whole proposal it went out to auction I was very lucky to get a publishing deal with a publisher called Hachette Go and we got to work so this was over two years ago now and <laughs> the cookbook is now being published but at the end of the day what I wanted the cookbook to be and I do think it, it kind of lived up to this is like the ultimate kind of manual for anybody who wants to adopt a plant-based lifestyle and is coming in from being green. That's why it has 140 recipes, breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert, appetizers, salad, dressing, sauces, cheese sauces, because I wanted people to be able to lean on it. Like, I don't know what to eat for breakfast if I'm plant-based. Well, there's like 30 recipes to choose from in there and they're really simple and like anybody can cook them. And then I had the foreword written by Dr. B. So it's very full circle and now it's here and it's just the craziest thing ever, like very surreal. And it's still to this day, I have like very, very bad imposter syndrome about the whole thing. Um, but I've accepted that perhaps the magic of the book is the fact that it's not written by a professional chef. It's a regular girl and these recipes are really, really easy. Uh, what a beautiful story. And the thing about your book, though, it's it's beautiful to look at, but it does, it really looks accessible. It doesn't feel overwhelming. And I think there is something, you figured out something with this infograph style thing, because when you see it laid out like that, your brain is like, oh, that's not too bad. And it's not like 30 bazillion ingredients and a million steps and everything looks amazing everything looks amazing by the way before i forget i saw you post the video of the trash can nachos and i had already <laughs> planned for my boys every super bowl i make them nachos and i saw that recipe and i asked my husband i was like what do you think about this and he's like yeah that's what we're gonna have so i will be making that this sunday for the super bowl so thank you so much for posting that but it, it, in the book, I just feel like and going through the breakfast and seeing the different smoothie recipes and then the sauces recipes at the end, which I'm a big sauce lover. I feel like if you have a sauce, you're good. You just throw together whatever and just put it with the sauce. Oh my God, so amazing. So I can't wait to try those. But I think you're onto something. And I'm glad that the synchronicity happened in your life the way it did because this book needed to come to life. 
And obviously it did because it's in high demand. So I'm very happy for you. And I know that it's going to help a lot of people that are ready, that they're ready to bring more plants into their life and they want to do it in a way that's not intimidating, that feels fun and is delicious. So thank you so much. Thank you. And it's we're in a bit of a weird situation, I must say now, because my audience response, like the Plant You community, I swear I could brag about them, but they're like the best people ever. They like wrapped their arms around this book and have pre-ordered so many copies that I had a call with my publisher yesterday and they're like, we're at risk of running out of stock um, a couple of weeks after your book is out. So like it could sell out in Barnes and Noble, et cetera. And because of these stockpile supply chain issues that are plaguing so many industries and specifically hardcover books, they're not going to get new books in until June. So if anybody's listening and they're like, I want a book, um, you might want to order now-ish because it's like a very odd situation <laughs> and I just feel so bad like I feel so bad that it's potentially selling out but the plant you community just just crazy and awesome well I'm not worried about it for those of you that are listening order now you're going to get your book eventually. Don't worry about it. In the meantime, Carly has like a million recipes on her Instagram and everything. So you will have plenty to do until your beautiful book comes in. And when your beautiful book comes in, you're going to have fun going through it. So definitely <laughs> order it because it is worth having on your shelf. Even if you're just going to look at the pictures because they're beautiful. Oh, and your cat. Your cat is the cutest thing. He's like the star of the book. You know, he's like the, the model next to all the recipes. <laughs> <laughs> I always say like he he is 100% the celebrity of the family and like I swear he's developing a bit of an ego on him like he he wants to be on camera he, he's he people love him my cat's name for anybody listening is King Tut and he's like this fluffy orange Persian cat and he's he's just something <laughs> Maybe he also helped all of this manifest because he wanted to be a star, like by default, through your recipes. So tell me, which recipe do you feel was the most difficult to bring to life in this book? I guess you kind of mentioned that the bran muffins failed and that the loaf, it took you a long time. Was there anything else that you feel was pretty difficult or you were having a hard time finding the right combination? For sure. So one of the recipes that were tested multiple times, um, just because I wanted them to be special, were cauliflower wings. I wanted to do something different. So it actually ended up being one of my favorite recipes in the book. But what they are, are cauliflower that's been like parboiled in vegan vegetable broth that kind of like tastes like a chicken broth and then wrapped in rice paper that's also been dipped in that broth and then broiled and honestly they're like you know how some cauliflower wings you get can be almost like too too wet like these are like mm -hmm. they're very wing like they've got skin they're so delicious they're light and incredible so those were that was a difficult kind of recipe testing process because you had to get the timing right in terms of the broiling of the rice paper on the skin and all of that but definitely well worthwhile and you'll see it in the book it has only four ingredients so it actually now that wow. it has been defined is very easy it's just the development of it not so much yeah you had to put a lot of love and passion into that one it sounds like what's your all-time favorite recipe in the book that's really, that's like choosing a favorite child. <laughs> but if I had to, actually this week we made, um, I'm very inspired by Thai food. Thai food is my favorite all-time mm. cuisine. And uh, in 2016, my fiance and I were really lucky to travel Thailand and I was able to take a cooking class and they were so gracious to amend everything for me to be vegan and I made this like red Thai curry from scratch uh, in this cooking class so I use the foundations of this recipe to create this red Thai curry soup and I talk about that in the head note but it's this is something we make so often like all the mm. time and the it's the versatile versatility of it as well because you can use basically any vegetable in your fridge. You've got broccoli, use broccoli. You've got cauliflower, use cauliflower. You've got sweet potato or regular potato. 
doesn't matter. It's going to turn out delicious. You can serve it over rice. You can serve it with ramen noodles. You can have it on its own. So it's like one of those really kind of mainstays that we have on a monthly, if not weekly basis that I just can't recommend enough. Oh, that sounds delicious. And I agree that Thai food in general, I feel like they use so many different vegetables and so many fresh vegetables, especially in the soups. So that makes sense to me that you can just use what you have and it's going to work because that broth is what really brings it together. That kind of was my next question is what is your food look like on a daily basis? I mean, you're spending all this time recipe testing and making these amazing recipes. Does everything that you make look so beautiful? <laughs> no. So like multiple times per week, we will have like a clean out the fridge stir fry. I have a couple of uh, like a tempeh stir fry that's very similar to what I'm talking about in the book. But it's like, again, using all of the vegetables in the fridge, throwing them in a pan with a little uh, soy sauce, hoisin sauce, and a little apple cider vinegar, stir frying that up and serving it over rice, quinoa, whatever grain you want to use. You can swap out the protein for tofu. And that is like a notoriously pretty ugly looking plate. Um, <laughs> and we have that a lot. Uh, obviously, because I'm recipe creating, we're trying different foods very often, but there's still those mainstays that seem to cycle through. In recipe creation, sometimes it's like you're making, especially with scrappy cooking, like I think one day this week I made, it hasn't been published yet, but ginger um, ice cubes. So how to use up your fresh ginger and blended it up with water and lemon juice and then put it with ice cubes and you can have it kind of like a ginger tea. But like that's not feeding us dinner, right? So it's oftentimes like the same sort of thing, stir fries, curries, love that and for lunch i'll typically have like either a veggie wrap or a smoothie veggies and hummus in a smoothie that's like my typical stuff i love english muffins like i'm very simple eater english muffin with peanut butter and raspberries it do, doesn't have to be crazy complicated and my diet definitely doesn't look like something you would expect i guess if you were kind of like looking at a recipe creator i love it well you know you're a woman that's, you've got a busy life. You have a lot to do, especially right now with your book launch. So I'm not surprised at all. And in fact, I asked that question almost to prove a point because I think that sometimes people look at Instagram and they do get disheartened and they're like, my food doesn't look like that every time. And that's totally fine. I mean, my life is the same. Like sometimes I like being in the kitchen and making these amazing recipes, but most of the time I'm just eating what tastes good and what feels good and what fuels my body so that I can do my work and do my job and move on, <laughs> you know, and 100%. that's completely fine. Completely fine. Uh, Carly, this has been so wonderful. You are amazing. I am so glad that you're out there doing the work that you're doing and inspiring so many people, helping make plant-based eating accessible and realistic for so many people. Please tell us what other services and products you offer and where listeners can connect with you. So my handle is plant you on basically every channel. You can find me at plant you on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Pinterest, all of it. Um, I also have a meal plan program called the Plant You Planner. It's a drag and drop meal planner that we have over 500 plant-based recipes in if you need a little more guidance on some beautiful plant-based food and want to be able to put it into your own meal plan. And then of course the cookbook is coming out, which is super, super exciting. And yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> so fun. Okay, well, my last question for you is to leave us with your favorite cooking hack that you can give to busy moms. Ooh, favorite cooking hack that I can give to busy moms is to pre-portion your smoothies. So whether you're using reusable Ziploc containers or freezable like mason jars or something, I always suggest to people like measure out, just do it once. It's gonna take five minutes, get out your frozen berries, your ground flax, your spinach, whatever you would normally put in your smoothie, put it all into a jar or a Ziploc, reusable container, put those in the fr freezer, you can prep five at a time and then all you have to do to make a smoothie that is like super loaded with a bunch of plants is add your plant milk and blend it up. That saves so much time and you can do the same thing with overnight oats. 
I love that. That is such a good idea. And I think I've heard that once before, but then I forgot about it. My older son, he makes a smoothie every morning before school because he goes straight to his weightlifting class in the morning. So we might try that and that'll save him time because, you know, teenagers, they'd rather sleep and it's good for them to sleep. So that is great. Carly, this has been so great. Thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on your book. Keep doing the work that you do. Thank you so much and have a very plantastic day. Thank you. I have so much gratitude for you and your audience. Oh my goodness. What a great episode. I heart Carly. You need to go follow her right now if you aren't already. Follow her her beautiful radiant smile and these amazing recipes and she's just amazing she's doing such great work and i'm just so glad that there's people out there that have the patience and the energy to test and create recipes because that's definitely not me i'm a little bit lazy but my food tastes amazing don't get me wrong my food tastes amazing but recipe creation is a whole beast like that takes time and energy just like she was saying how many days it took for her to test this muffin that eventually she just scrapped and she's like, nope, that's not gonna go in the book. That's a lot of time and energy. So we have to support these recipe creators that are doing such great work so that we can eat amazing food when we don't have the inspiration. So please follow her. And I also wanted to mention for those of you that are new to the show or just didn't realize, I have interviewed Dr. Will Bolsowich it was episode 98.5, Getting Fiber Fueled with Dr. B. It's a fantastic episode. We will link the episode in the show notes so that you can easily go to that episode if you want to listen to it. But such great information. And she's right. He's doing amazing work as well. And he's onto something with those plant points. I think the more we can simplify this for everybody, make it easier for people just to choose more whole plant foods. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, y'all. It doesn't. If you're not all the way there, that's okay. How can you incorporate more whole plant foods into your life? Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts and seeds, and they taste so good. There is no deprivation here. Remember, it is not deprivation. It is abundance. All right, you need to get off of your phone right now. Well, stay on your phone, but get off of this episode. If you have not already pre-ordered Carly's book, go now and pre-order it. Plant You is the name of the book, all together one word, P-L-A-N-T-Y-O-U, and that is Carly Bodrug. Follow her, buy her book, enjoy plants. Thank you so much for listening, veggie lovers, and I hope you have a very plantastic day. Hey, veggie lover, I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.